cows are generally held to be pleasant and likable. At first glance, their lives seem familiar. But there's so much more to cows. These cows are unlike any others, and the story of Samura and her unusual herd reveals why. Far from big city bustle, tucked away in a southwestern corner of Germany, lies a special farmstead. 50 dairy cows form the heart of the Hottenloch Hof farm, home to the bovine community of Samura the cow. She was born here and has already seen 11 of its summers. Like all her barn associates, Samura sports ear and neck decor. But a triangular white blaze on her forehead and a similarly colored beauty spot on the tip of her nose are her exclusive hallmark, as are her evenly shaped horns, both pointing upwards. Samura's herd leads a very different life to that of millions of their species forced to live permanently locked up in stalls. 30 years ago, their owner, farmer Alexander Zulik, decided that his cows should lead as natural a life as possible. Although they also strive to make a profit, the well-being of the animals is the main focus of this organic farm and the oldest dairy cow, Samura, plays a very important role for the farmer. You can tell she's really at home here now. She's the cowshed leader, a role model by nature. She radiates calm and serenity and has experience in being around us humans and also with her environment. And that gives the herd tremendous stability. Samura and the other cows spend the entire winter in their stalls, eating dried grass stores and mostly standing around on concrete. It's high time to head for the lush meadows. And as every year on May the 1st, onlookers gather to witness the herd's reappearance outdoors. The weather is playing along nicely. Cows prefer rain and cool weather to dryness and heat. Nothing and no one can hold back the herd now. They charge to freedom. These are hardly clumsy cattle, 600 kilos prancing about on nimble legs. Cows are surprisingly light-footed if they're just given a chance. Heavyweights enjoy the soft ground, smell the scent of the earth and the fresh grass. There's around 80 hectares of it at their disposal on the farm, and it's where they do their job, eat and eat and produce milk.
Unlike most other dairy cows in the country, this herd is allowed to spend all day in the fields throughout the summer. Samura too, of course. We're creatures of nature, cows are creatures of nature, and I believe cows are actually more a part of nature than we humans are. And this is where they are really home, in nature. Every day, Samura eats up to 150 kilograms of fodder, only grass, herbs and clover. By the evening, her body turns this into around 18 litres of milk. Samura only produces milk because she's pregnant, but artificial insemination, as practiced on many other dairy farms, is out of the question at Hottenloch. Seven months earlier, she encountered Sam, the farm's two-year-old bull. He lives apart from the females, and their nuptials take place under careful observation in the stall. Sam still lacks experience, so his advances seem a bit clumsy. By means of this rather basic courtship ritual, they both test their readiness to mate. Sam shows Samura firmly who's in charge. After a bit of wrestling, he clearly gets the message she's sending out. He knows she's ready. Now it's up to him to ensure that offspring will result. It's hard to get it right at first. Patiently, she repeatedly invites him. Farmer Zulik is a little concerned. What if it doesn't work? But Sam doesn't let the farmer down. And after all the strenuous activity, the couple takes a break. Samura has been pregnant nine times in her life, once even with twins. Having made his contribution, Sam will have no further role to play in his offspring's life. While the Hottenloch's only bull is segregated from the rest of the herd, the cows he has impregnated graze together in the meadow, produce milk, and give birth to his calves, as does Samura. The Hottenloch cows are allowed to live life much more in tune with their instincts than stall-held cows, so their behavior is more natural too. They seem very happy, surrounded by greenery. Not all breeds are as well suited to this type of grazing as German black pied cattle. I think they're very alert. You can compare that with how one categorizes horses, cold blood or warm blood, and these are a bit more warm blooded. They're sort of more extroverted. Fleck fee or red pies and other breeds are more introspective, but these are more open to the kind of livestock farming we're attempting here. Samura's herd also has some stubborn members that feel driven to fight out their disputes.
but they also show their affection. Through mutual licking, cows strengthen their relationships, which stabilizes and relaxes the herd. Their wild ancestors roaming the European steppes demonstrated similar behaviors too. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. These ancient forebears of our dairy cows of today were aurochs. Some 10,000 years ago, they began to be bred as working animals from which many of our cattle breeds descended. The aurochs was eradicated here in the 17th century. Zoologists have tried to recreate them by breeding selectively from certain breeds. The aurochs supposedly looked similar to these heck cattle, big and powerful, but also wild and moody. They're used only in fenced-in areas for landscape conservation. Today, all cattle are farm animals, of the four million dairy cows in Germany, not even half of them graze in pastures. Cows are increasingly being kept exclusively in stalls because the open pastures do not provide enough food for high production cattle and because it's very expensive. The idyll is deceptive. For Alexander Zulik, it's a laborious job rounding up his cattle from the pasture to milk them every evening. His dog, Luna, has to help the cows shake a leg and hoof it back to the shed. They certainly wouldn't do it on their own. Why should they when they have everything they want out here? Alexander Zulik wouldn't have to go to all this trouble with stall-held cows, but he wants his cattle to spend most of the day in an animal-friendly environment outdoors. Samura is neither first nor last. She avoids stress wherever she can. Once the cows are on track, the procession trots the one kilometer back to the shed. There's no need for Alexander and Luna to help anymore. The exercise is good for the cow's muscles. Cows are creatures of habit. They're milked twice a day. They know the way and usually enter the boxes one by one without unnecessary jostling. The Hottenloch doesn't have a modern milking robot. Zulik and his assistants lend a hand preparing the cows for milking. It takes more time, but that way they can feel whether the udders are healthy. And Zulik is convinced that the close proximity of farmer to cow improves the quality of the milk. Samura has so far given the farmer 55,000 liters of milk in her lifetime, although not entirely voluntarily. The whole thing is easy if they think that I'm a calf. So it's like I'm the one that's taking it, which is why it works pretty well. So we're a kind of substitute calf. Samura will be milked for the last time today. Two months prior to giving birth, she's dried off, as the farmer puts it. Her mammary glands and metabolism need to rest. She has to build up strength for the imminent birth of her 11th calf.
The Hoddenloch estate has been in existence for around 600 years. Today, it's run by three families along biodynamic lines. Each has their own tasks. They all live off the production of milk, cheese and meat, but also the cultivation of fruit and vegetables. This type of agriculture is only possible thanks to customers who are willing to pay more for good milk and healthy food. But even this farm could not survive without subsidies. Hard work lies behind the idyllic facade, because in addition to the cattle, they also keep sheep, pigs and chickens. The farm seems picturesque, straight out of a storybook. <coughs> the cows all spend their nights in the cowshed. They're fed only grass and hay from the region, no additional fodder concentrate. Samura is fastidious. She selects the tastiest morsels, and she doesn't like sharing. Every day she spends eight hours just eating, and she likes eating a lot. She tips the scales at around 650 kilograms, but Samura isn't a high production cow. She yields far less milk, but she's also seldom sick and she has already lived more than twice as long as most others of her breed that are held in industrially managed, large-scale agricultural enterprises. Samura can move about freely in her stall. She isn't chained or squeezed in. She can groom herself and avoid contact with less friendly stallmates. Her greenery attracts borrowers. Sparrows reap benefits from it, as do swallows. Open stabling is a survival factor for various bird species. In contrast to hermetically sealed industrial halls holding thousands of cows being fattened up, birds can move in here as subtenants. And here's something else that's no longer a common sight. Hottenloch cows have horns. Some are crescent-shaped, some point upwards, or downwards. Horns are an integral part of a cow, says farmer Zulik. So the frontal sinus sort of grows into the horn. That is, a bone forms in the horn that keeps growing outwards with the horn. And of course, it's interesting that with every bite and when they breathe, it kind of gets flushed through all the time. Something happens, there's an exchange between the atmosphere, the animal and the horn. Cows know every millimeter of the space in which their horns move, every millimeter. As they move past me, they sense every single millimeter with their horn. It's incredible. It's a sensory organ. The headgear can also be used to gain respect. It's one reason why, in many other barns, calves' horns are removed, debudded, by painfully burning them away. But despite still having horns, these cows rarely injure each other. In the Hottenloch cowshed, peace prevails. Because the cows can choose their neighbors, they tend to form friendships instead. Samura is very popular. Cows embrace each other with their tongues. Mm. 
the flexible organ is really useful for all kinds of things. After they've eaten, it's time for a rest in the cubicle. Samura does it her own way. She doesn't like staring at the wall, preferring to keep an eye on what's going on around her. She lies down elegantly for some calm rumination. In her daily life, it's all about producing offspring and her job. Appearances don't matter. They do here, though. These cows are being prepared for a nationwide beauty competition in a washing bay for brown cattle in Ostalgoy, 150 kilometers east of Samura. First, the barn dirt must be removed from their coat. Then the cow stylists get to work. They groom and blow dry their sturdy clients until their hides gleam. Spray, gel, oil, all of it employed to achieve a single aim, showcasing the ideal cow. Judges evaluate the appearance, demeanor, and character of the dandified cows. Udders, contours, and bone structure are graded. The farmer's objective at the exhibition is to make the greatest impression on potential buyers. The more beautiful the cow, the more a breeder can earn. After the awards ceremony, the top models are all maneuvered into position for a beauty shot. Fishing lines to tighten up the tail and other little tricks help the photographer to make the cow look regal. The important thing is to keep her calm and still so the picture is in focus. Samura has other problems. Shortly before parturition, pregnant cows weigh 100 kilograms more than usual. Their udders are so big that they get in the way even when they're standing up. Samura needs plenty of peace and quiet. Together with a fellow mother-to-be, Iolanthi, she has moved away from the others in search of shade, bushes and long grass for protection. An instinctive move, as that way she won't lure enemies to the herd while giving birth. It's only a matter of hours now before the birth is due to begin. The other cows carry on grazing at a distance and they all have to return to the milking shed together at the end of the day as usual. At Hottenloch, young and old learn how to round up cattle together. You have to acknowledge the beast. You need a calm approach, an objective approach. I always know beforehand what a cow will do, and if you have that attitude, then not much can actually go wrong. Cattle are herded from behind. They dislike sudden movements. At Hottenloch, it goes without a hitch. But countrywide, there are fatal accidents every year because humans don't behave properly towards cattle, don't treat them carefully.
two-thirds of all calves are born at night, and Samura's calf is expected at any time now. To ensure she gets enough rest, the farmer has put Samura into a separate enclosure. His instincts are correct, because nine months after the rendezvous with Sam, the birth begins. But it's not without complications. Instead of the front legs, the calf's hind legs are sticking out of her body. It's going to be a breech delivery. Farmer Zulik is concerned. He assesses the situation. There's no movement, a dangerous situation for both mother and calf. The farmer can see that Samura is suffering. The farmer and his wife make a decision. They're going to help with the birth using rope and sheer strength but it can easily go wrong. The calf is alive, but it's weak and needs to be accepted quickly by Samura. It's moving and awakens her maternal instincts. Samura massages her offspring with powerful tongue strokes, stimulating the calf's circulation. It's a little girl. They both quickly develop a close bond. In order to drink, it's vital that the calf be able to stand on its own legs quickly. Not an easy task. The struggle against gravity begins. Two hours after the birth, it succeeds. The calf is perfectly healthy. It can stand, and now it has to drink its mother's first milk. The little one nuzzles, but is seeking the source at the wrong end. Dairy cows have large udders with low hanging teats. The farmer steps in again to help. He milks the so-called colostrum, the first milk a cow produces after giving birth, that contains vital hormones and antibodies for the calf. It's essential that the young animal gets to drink it. The aim and direction are good, but the calf still hasn't succeeded. If the calf can't get to the source of the milk, then the milk has to come to the calf. A bucket fitted with a teat ensures that the little one gets its first draft of magic potion. But after that, it will have to practice finding its mother's teats on its own. For now, everything has gone well. <laughs> The calf stays on with Samura in the stall. At Hottenloch, calves are not immediately taken away from their mothers to be reared in isolated calf pens. This is often what happens on large farm holdings, so they can sell more milk.
On this farm, the calves stay with their mothers or are put together with other foster mothers. With their help, the calves familiarize themselves with their surroundings. Dairy cows yield three times more milk than their own calves need, so foster mothers can nurse other calves if they're temperamentally suited for it. Under the care of the bigger cows in the pasture, the little ones quickly learn to distinguish between plants they can digest and poisonous ones. From the second week onwards, at the latest, they eat greenery in addition to milk. Protected by their foster mums, the nursery calves can also spend some summer nights outside. They need not fear predators. And wolves, though returning westwards, are still rare in southwest Germany. So the calves can enjoy the advantages of their pasture in safety. Samora's 10-day-old calf is still with her mother in the stall. Today, there's a test in store for the little heifer. Farmer Zulik arrives and he's especially interested in the calf. What has he got in mind? Two ear tags for ID purposes, a painful but necessary procedure. I don't like it. This kind of thing, the size, I don't think it should have to be like that. It's a necessary evil. But for the consumer and ultimately also for traceability purposes, in what's become an anonymous market, of course it's needed. And it makes sense to have it. The shock seems to be over quickly, forgotten in her mother Samura's presence. With the ear tag, Zulik has also given the calf a name, Subira. It's a Swahili word from East Africa and means patience, because she stayed so long in her mother's womb. Subira has now also patiently learned how to find her mother's teats and helps herself. In the first couple of weeks, the heifer spends more than 20 hours a day sleeping. A good chance for Samura also to regain her strength for the parental duties of a solo mum. A cow only needs 30 minutes of deep sleep a day. All around Samura's farm, the Hottenloch Farming Cooperative has leased meadows which they cultivate. They're a kind of backup resource. The farmer has to provide for his hungry gang. Alexander Zulik mows the grass several times a year, stockpiling it as feed for the cold season. Even in winter, his cows and calves only get meadow herbage to eat. The stored harvest has to last for six months with nothing extra bought in. He only wants to keep as many cows as his land can support. Today, that's by no means the norm. Large quantities of grain and concentrated feed are imported from distant countries to supply other farms. 
Mowing the fresh grass, the farmer attracts hungry visitors. Kites circle above the tractor. Their sharp eyes scan the ground for prey because pasture land is an ideal habitat for many small animals. Now there's no green paradise anymore. Mice and worms have lost their cover. Thrushes and other birds reap the benefits of Zulik's labors. And the kite is hungry too. The mouse was faster. Kites need meadows that are rich in a variety of species to survive. Ever fewer grazing cows, less and less pasture land. In many places, beet and maize are grown on valuable soil, destined for use as concentrated fodder to fatten up stall-held cattle. Plant and insect biodiversity is being irretrievably lost. Alexander Zulik does not want to be a part of this process. Pasture grazing is an amazing thing. It's wonderful that the land feeds the cows while simultaneously the cows enrich the land with their manure because maggots grow in the manure, insects that provide food for the birds. One can say that the cow fosters life throughout the landscape. With their manure, cows create feeding and breeding grounds for many insects. The cowpats are hotbeds of biodiversity as countless flies and beetles hatch and grow in the warm droppings. And the manure fertilizes the soil with minerals. A variety of flowers grow around the manure piles in the pastures, attracting insects and providing food for birds. Many species depend on grazing livestock for their survival, no longer possible in the vast monoculture stretches of corn and rapeseed. At Lake Constance, not far from Hottenloch, they've recognized the signs of the time. Here, cows are put out to graze to promote species protection and lake views. The cows responsible? Hinterwald cattle, the smallest breed in Central Europe. Robust, undemanding, and light-footed specialists that can make best use of the sparse slopes of the southern Black Forest. This is where they graze and supply milk and meat. Hinterwald cattle are good feed converters, fertile, and live longer than high production cows. Wherever they graze, they keep the landscape clear, which enables rare plants, such as orchids, to grow. Their pastures are home to a far greater number of species than are found in forests, where, without hungry cows, they wouldn't survive. Hinterwald cows yield far less milk than other breeds, so they were no longer considered useful. As a result, there are only a few dozen of them left. But now this threatened species once again has a future.
Their appetite helps preserve species-rich meadows and orchards. Livestock and landscape coexist harmoniously. There's no measurable cash profit to be had, but it's a boon for the scenery and the ecosystem. Birds thrive in these rural cultivated landscapes. Red-backed shrikes, for instance, and starlings. And almost as a thank you to the cows for their work, they keep their quadruped neighbors free of annoying pests. Young ones trust the sharp beaks of these natural cosmeticians. Cows don't mind the lower temperatures in autumn. They're cool creatures anyway, who avoid the heat. They prefer it below 20 degrees centigrade. Samora is back in the pasture, and with her is her calf, Subira, now three months old and progressing well. Samora keeps an eye on the little one, who comes straight away when her mother calls. Samura has her own rhythm. She's not always ready to give milk. And so, gradually, she weans her daughter, even though Subira may not like the idea. But soon she'll be completely independent of her mother, self-reliant and self-confident. I think that because Samura herself, as a cow, has this nature, this amenability, and also her seniority in the herd, that this in some way transmits itself to the calf. The calf isn't shy. While the dairy herd grazes as usual, Samura is now part of a foster mother group. She not only takes care of Subira, but also of several of her neighbor's offspring. Not every cow is suited to the job, but Samura is good-natured, though she does still differentiate between her own offspring and those that aren't hers. In the foster group, the calves learn many of the bovine world's social rules, including how to wait for the right moment. Samura is feeding three calves with her milk, but other youngsters will also try to get a few mouthfuls. And although all the available positions are occupied, sometimes another calf will join the queue. Five calves and four teats. As usual, Samura reacts calmly. In early November, the greenery in the fields is getting scarce, and the season's final bounty beckons. The herd is looking forward to the tasty morsels underneath the fruit trees. Cows are especially fond of apples. They select carefully from among the offerings. The trick is to make sure not to drop the fruit, but also not to swallow it whole. The spherical object must be eaten in an unaccustomed way, with their head up. Sometimes it's just not worth the effort. And occasionally the fruit can even cause a problem.
cows have no upper front teeth, so they use their muscular tongue to push the apple against the roof of their mouth and crush it. The grazing season is almost over. For Alexander Zulik, it's time to clear the fields. Thanks to an intact electric fence, none of the animals escaped this year. Breakouts are an ever-present threat for keepers of grazing cattle. They could face ruin if the entire herd were to descend on a village or block a motorway. As the fields are getting muddy and the grass has stopped growing, he has already herded his cows back to their shed. By the time winter arrives and covers the fields in a white blanket, there are no cows left outdoors. The open stable will be the cow's abode for a long time to come. The farmer forks together dried grass that he mowed in the meadows during summer. 1,500 cubic meters of stored greenery will have to see the cows through the winter. This year's calves are now separated from their mothers in the farm's nursery and are introduced to barn life. Like Samura's offspring, Subira, they all have to get closer together and make do with less space. Housing in sheds is always a compromise for a creature that has for millennia lived outdoors in nature, grown up there, and therefore I'd say this urge to get out into nature where its primal instincts can be stirred again, is extremely strongly embedded. And that's why it's important for cows to get outside. As often as he can, he lets his calves out. But first, they have to learn that pushing and shoving doesn't achieve anything. their first experience of snow. It's icy cold, soft and dazzling, but cows are inquisitive and have to investigate anything new. There are plucky cows and cautious ones. Every animal has its own character. But the young cattle all enjoy the white covering underfoot, like children in a snowball fight. The animals don't mind temperatures of up to minus 10 degrees centigrade. Their bodies are protected by a thick winter coat. And even with snow, the delicate vegetation tastes better than plain dry hay in the stall. Subira is now six months old. Another year, and she will become pregnant for the first time. That's how it works on a dairy farm. <coughs> Subira experiences her first spring away from her mother. Samura, on the other hand, is celebrating her 12th birthday. A few more grey hairs than before, but otherwise unchanged. Subira and Samura recognize each other's voices, but the bond is getting weaker. The young bulls will not grow up here. The farm also survives by selling meat. But the young cows will grow up at Hottenloch under special conditions. 
When we let the cows out to pasture, it's always an uplifting feeling for us too, not just for the cows. And that's when you actually really experience the difference between stabling and what nature intended. Another May the 1st, the cows are released again. Thousands of years of breeding and selection as livestock have not destroyed their wild heritage. Given the chance, cows demonstrate a surprising range of feelings. They're sociable and sometimes quarrelsome creatures, and by no means merely stupid, high-performance machines. This is the message eloquently sent out from the world of the herd surrounding Samura the cow.